everyone, welcome. My name is Isra Banks. I am an architect and every at each episode I interview either a community leader, an expert, um, uh, probably a legislator to discuss city, future cities and to answer questions about how do we make better future for our children and the next generation in terms of sustainability, health, and social justice. Um, these are the topics that Jim Horton are going to help us shape and talk about uh, his relationship with the city of Boston, how uh, it has been shaping over the years and how um, it helped him grow and uh, what does he think, how does he feel. Uh, Jim Hood is uh, a designer and pretty much involved in the um, let's say environmental design because he designs uh, lots of um, let's say signs uh, for buildings and real estate and he has his own practice gym de uh, you know, hood design and um, yeah hood design Jim Hood is also a professor at Leslie University he's been um, teaching generations and generations of students in, in the design and the graphic design realm. Uh, I personally know that Jim is passionate about gardens, about architecture, about design in general. Um, and I let you introduce yourself too, Jim. Let us know about you. <laughs> Thanks, Ezra. Um, well, what I, I don't know how much you've not covered there. That was pretty inclusive. And um, yeah, I've been a graphic designer um, all of my adult life and also with an interest in architecture, typography, which is a writing system. And um, I uh, also very um, involved with parks in terms of being a park user, but also um, on the board of the Friends of the Public Garden, which represents three of our chief urban parks in Boston, Boston Common, the Public Garden, and the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. And um, I live in the South End. I, I've been here for many, many years. Uh, moved here in 1983 when it was a, a different place. And um, I've lived in Boston a total of 42 or 43 years. And um, so it feels very much like home. And um, it's also been a real pleasure to see so many things in Boston improve over time. And chiefly of that, I would say um, important to me is that, that we've become a more integrated city, a more international city. Um, and um, you know, the house I live in uh, is a 1850s brick uh, uh, row house. And um, it was once a single story house, uh, not a single story, a single family house. And today it has uh, four families in it, four, four condominiums. And under our single roof, we have Muslims, Christians, Jews, and non-believers, and we are a happy lot. And it's sort of a microcosm of my neighborhood, um, it, which is pretty diverse as Boston goes. And um, yeah, so, so I've seen Boston change quite a lot. Boston has a lot of history for an American city. It's an old city for a European city. No, not so old, but um, some people say it's the most European appearing of mm. American cities. And it is in some ways. And, and then in other ways, it is very, very American place. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what I are the ways? What are the ways that makes it similar to your European city? To a European city? Oh, maybe the scale and continuity of house heights and types so that... Um, you know, if I look at Chicago, they'll, yeah, there'll be like three or four 19th century row houses. And then there's a 40 story apartment building beside it. And so, uh, you know, zoning didn't quite take root early enough there. 
um, to preserve uh, a large neighborhood like the South End or Back Bay or Beacon Hill or the Fenway. And, and so, you know, we have, we have real typologies of houses and, you know, we have triple deckers in Dorchester and South Boston in parts of JP. And then we have uh, brick row houses in the South End and we have grander houses on uh, in the back bay and on commonwealth avenue they you know it can really you don't have to squint very much for it to look a bit in places like london and other places it looks very french um depending who the architects were and um so um and we're 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 blessed that early on there were people who discovered the need to preserve our heritage and um, that goes back to preserving the old state house, pre preserving old South meeting house on Washington street, which was near, nearly torn down. It survived the great fire um, and then nearly got ripped down for new buildings. And um, it's where the revolution was planned. And um, so it's, it's kind of sacred ground. Um, and, um, and the old state house built in 1713 in the English Baroque style is the first place that, um, uh, that, um, publicly elected legislature was seated in the new world. And, and to me, that's a really important statement about self-government. And, um, it's also the first place, um, in Massachusetts where the, Declaration of Independence was publicly read some days after it was signed and it was printed in Philadelphia by a woman, which is a, a good detail about American history. And it was printed in a lovely English typeface called Caslon, which all of our founding documents, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution and the Declaration are set in. And um, uh, so, uh, um, it was read for the, the the declaration was read from the balcony of the old state house and um you know it's funny to live in a city where the old state house is 1713 and the new state house what we call the new state house is like something like 1790 <laughs> and um, <laughs> it shows that um yeah we have a few old nice old buildings here for sure um so I, I also like to think about our city in terms of uh, class. And I think class sometimes gets confused with race. Um, it, the recent um, concentration of wealth in America has made it so that uh, very few people who work in the city doing the uh, more, uh, what would I call the, the lower skilled jobs, the jobs like butchering jobs, like cleaning hotel rooms, washing our dishes in restaurants, uh, people who clean our rooms in hospitals, um, people who keep the heat going, keeping the electricity going. Unfortunately, fewer and fewer of them can afford to own in our city. There's a, a, a you and I've spoken before, there's a word out there called um, gentrification. And I'm not particularly fond of it because I think it suggests that the people left here in the city are all gentry. And gentry are, you know, in my mind, people who go on fox hunts and wear, you know, ride horses and own big mansions and stuff like that. And I think the people who are able to live here in the city, it does still include some people who are not the top of the heap and who are very important, but are skilled laborers like nurses and can afford to be here. And so, you know, the problem for us is to make a city that everyone who works here can live here. And maybe they won't be living on Beacon Hill or in Back Bay or the South End, but maybe they can live in JP, Alston, uh, Dorchester, uh, 
Charlestown. But right now, it's not possible in any of those places. Um, even in Roxbury to buy a house today uh, is is a big, big step for most for most people who are low skill laborers. Um, well, even high skill. Even even high skilled high skilled laborers, yes. And I mean, you know, I I am fortunate to own this condominium, which is where I have my practice, and to own a condominium on Appleton Street, where we live. And um, I'm fortunate to have that, and to um, uh, and to have my mortgage paid. And, um, but I don't know that if I were coming to Boston today with my skill sets, if I could do it again, if the economy would allow me to live here, work and save and buy. And that's the problem we have. And, and, and it really impacts, you know, to get back to something like the declaration or the constitution is, can we afford to be a democracy if we are so stratified, if if the poorest people who are doing a lot of very important labor, um, which we I think the pandemic forced us to realize that, you know, it's it's not really the captains of finance and industry and biotech um, that are important. You know, that's very important to us. I mean, the vaccinations both of them, both of the major ones in the United States, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, the primary research and development was done in the Boston area in Cambridge. And so that's a real feather in our cap and that's very, very important work. But getting us food, keeping the lights on, uh, delivering heating oil, um, lots of other things don't quite pay enough for you to live here. And it's not that everyone has to live here, but I, I guess I feel that it would be a shame if this became a place only of a sort of business cultural elite. Um, cultural people, people, artists can't afford to live here. Um, you know, maybe the few superstar artists like a Jeff Koons or something, but. We talked about your practice and uh and um, the way that you design um, signs for buildings. And uh, I was always curious about how do that affect our visual environment, especially when I know if you have a stand um, against or with um, um, technological like screens and let's say the New York City billboards. Yeah. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we have places for all of these things in Boston. I think you, you, you asked me um, or, or shared with me a possible question is, what do I think about digital signs? Mm -hmm. They have a lot of presence. Um, they, are, they are a medium and in the same way capable of delivering a lot of information, um, but it gets down to the content that is put on them and there need to be some guidelines for it. And of course they shouldn't be perhaps everywhere. Um, there are places, there are zones. The theater district is doing a beautiful job of it right now with really large digital signs and mm -hmm. it's appropriate. And some of them are on very tall buildings. Um, a part of this neighborhood in an area that was light industry where a lot of printing happened, of newspapers, that kind of thing. Ink block has some fairly large digital signs as well. Um, and in the right context and the right neighborhood, uh, that they, they can be really a good addition, fine, better than neutral. They can be a, a positive addition. And I think most Bostonians have a bit of a soft spot in their heart for the Sitco sign. Um, we equate it with Fenway and Kenmore neighborhoods and and but we also somehow have grafted it onto our experience of the Boston Red Sox and Fenway Park because we see it there when we sit in the stands and um, and so yeah there's there's place for that in an old city 
And, um, but there's also places like, you know, I've done signs on Beacon Hill where given the context of the area, I've used main black slate and had it carved and the letters infilled with either a color or metallic gold or something like that. In the back bay, I've used uh, a fair bit of, uh, in commercial areas, I've done um, signs that are metal. Uh, we don't do a lot of internal illumination in historic neighborhoods like Back Bay or South End or Beacon Hill. So it's just, you know, but they get externally lit or lit by ambient light for evening. And um, they're they, on a commercial street, they can be more modernist, more contemporary. But, you know, on Commonwealth Avenue uh, and Marlboro Street, Beacon Street, I've done signs for buildings and there I tend to go with bronze. Something quieter, something that, that feels at home sitting on brick. And um, so um, that gets used more there here in the South End. Um, we, we tend to use uh, similar things. We use bronze, we use, um, we use sometimes routed wood, uh, cast resin, a uh, variety of things. Uh, we also have a very uh, challenging climate here. Today is a very, very hot day. Um, and so, you know, those signs heat up, they expand. And yet February is not so far away and there's some really punishing cold ahead too. So we, we get the, the, the extremes on both ends and you need a material that it's going to last that can fit in that. So there sometimes I use stainless steel, sometimes I use aluminum, sometimes I use cast resin uh things like that so uh, i understand so far that uh, you're following mostly intuition and judging if this is if this and all designers do that if this is uh, let's say suitable for this spot or this neighborhood or not but if we want to think about we want to be a more inclusive um society or culture and if we think, think about people who have mental illnesses or hidden disabilities like uh, ADHD or um, autism, and uh, when, at certain points, all these signs and information around them would be, um, what's the word, overwhelming. So I, from what you described, I'm sure that you're taking that in, into consideration, but we know that ADA um, guidelines did not, or laws, let's say, did not include hidden disabilities yet, and, and probably they won't in the near future. So if you're advising, let's say, younger designers, what they, sh what should they be looking for um, in terms of um, making the environment more friendly or more accommodating to a, a wider range of, of people? Well, ADA really does um, impact a lot of signage, um, mm -hmm. primarily internally in a building, but also um, there's external considerations too. Uh, someone, in, an adult in a wheelchair is at a very different height from a standing walking adult. And uh, so, you know, accessibility for using a call box to, you know, in the base floor, in the first floor of this building to get to my office, they have to scroll and find my name, my office name and press call and then I can buzz them in. But mm -hmm. um, you can do that at a five foot level or five and a half foot level, which might be very comfortable for a standing person. Maybe even that would be a little low for them, but for someone in a wheelchair, that's not good. Um, they, they, they just can't do it. And so they tend to be lower and they need to be, and the rest of us can stoop over a little bit and bend and we need to, it's, it's part of, uh, you know, we're, we're able to do that. Um, so there, there are things like that. There's distances, um, but so much in this city 
is determined by existing regulation and precedent. So if I want to get something done, I need to be able to cite a precedent of something, you know? And so I would say Charlestown, Back Bay, North End, Beacon Hill, South End, uh, there's pretty strong regulation, existing regulation there. Same thing in Cambridge, Brookline, uh, less so in JP, but there was some stuff there too. And, um, and same thing in, in uh, South Boston and parts of Dorchester. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's considerations there. Uh, things, uh, things need to be legible. Um, mm. But one thing I love explaining to people is legibility doesn't mean just making the type bigger. Um, it, it is every bit as important as having empty space, counter form around form that stops out the noisy world and lets someone's eye focus on the sign. So um, I would perhaps choose to have a, you know, I don't know, I'm just going to say a, a, a 2000 point sign uh, with six inches, eight inches of space minimum all around it, then to have that same shape side, but with the type almost filling it and not having any empty space around it. That one is actually gonna be more difficult to read. Um, and um, for, for everyone, not just people who have vision, uh, impaired vision. And so, yeah. There are considerations like that. So as a Bostonian, let's say, uh, what do you enjoy the most about the city? And, and how does your relationship with your neighbors, your business, the business owners around you, how does it look like from um, compared to someone like me who lives in a, I do have an apartment complex, but it's completely outside the city. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, my family was very surprised when they began visiting me from Vermont, where we grew up in a town of, when we were children, fewer than 500 people. Today, that's more than doubled. It's still very few people. And the neighboring large town that we were just outside of, Montpelier, the state capital, is extremely small. It has fewer than 8,000 residents. And so um, it's easy to think that you need to have a small number of people and not a lot of urbanity in order to have a friendly connection with your community. And so these, my, these siblings and my parents were really amazed how friendly Boston was and how many people uh, knew me as we would walk down the street, my neighbors and business owners and things like that. And um, so I think cities in some ways and country are a bit alike socially and that people talk to each other. And I feel uh, suburbs can sometimes be a bit more of an isolated place mm. where people would go inward. Not always, you know, there's the, you know, famous cul-de-sacs where all the kids know each other and run house to house. And, mm. and, and that's, you know, another, of course, valid way of living. But, um, but I think, you know, I know everyone in my building. I have keys to everyone in, in my building, in, in the house that I live in, the four units. I have been in a neighbor's apartment feeding their cat while they were visiting their family and in walks another neighbor from downstairs who said, Oh, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm feeding scooter. And she said, Oh, I'm moving John's car because it's street sweeping day. And so that's the sort of connection. And I know, you know, I know most of the business owners around here, you know, some because I've done work for them, but more because I'm their customer. And, uh, um, so there's, there's a long time relationship with each other. And, and so in some ways, Boston is like a big village. Um, 
That yeah. is very interesting. I never, I, I read a lot about cities and never, never read that or never heard that comparison between small village center and the city. That's, that's outstanding. Yeah, definitely it's not the feeling of a suburb where people are mostly isolated. Yeah. And I noticed last winter um, that during the pandemic, like people needed to get out. And where did so many people con uh, just concentrated on using uh, the common and the public garden? And I would go to the public garden. We would go every Sunday, get a coffee, walk around and look at things that we liked, see the progress of the amount of snow arriving or leaving looking at the buds of the tree as spring coming near, looking at our, our favorite sculptures and watching people skating and talking with people and um, it offered a, a place of having some community, but with social distancing. And um, so um, I think Boston is, is really a very, very livable place. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a good city to, to uh, uh, it is walkable in a way that San Francisco is not quite as walkable. It's, it's, it's a bit more spread out, not as concentrated. You know, would I, would I walk to Alston from my office? Probably not. I'd probably take the green line, but it wouldn't take long. Um, I had a niece in town Monday evening arriving to attend MIT. She grew up in Texas. And, um, you know, from my office, I got on the Silver Line and was taken to very close to Park Street, where I got off the bus and got on the Red Line to Kendall Square. And the whole thing took 16 minutes, probably, probably faster than an Uber and much less money and uh, more efficient use of energy. So, um, you know, it, it, it works overall. It does, it does work. Um, yeah. Plus I'm a bicyclist, so that is a good way to get around the city. And, and I, good for your you, health. And good for your health, it really is. Um, it, it, you see that in, in Copenhagen and you see it in Amsterdam and Berlin where there are a lot of ride share programs. Montreal has them, but just the, basically an increasingly bike dependent population. And I'm so glad that, you know, the last few years, our bike share uh, program has not closed for the winter. It remains open, um, somewhat reduced in some areas, but, but it's open and um, that's good for us. So you use the bike share or you use your own? I, own, I, I, I almost always use my own, but there are times though when I don't want to deal with the traffic of getting over to uh, Columbia Point where the Kennedy Library is. And we will drive there and we'll get on bikes and then go around Pleasure Bay, uh, then lock up our bikes over at Pleasure Bay, put, you know, put them back. And then we'll do a walk around there and then we'll go get jump back on the blue bikes and go back to Columbia and uh, lock up our bikes there into you know the public bikes and then drive home, which is you know really it's silly. It's about an hour. Excuse me, it's about a mile and a half. Um, but I I sometimes really don't want to drive through uh, the traffic of South Boston. It, mm -hmm. It's kind of intense, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have options. You have either go through the subway, bike, your own bike, use a bike, and, and this is awesome. And this is, we, we know from research, like the more options people ha have, the, the, the friendlier they are, the best, the better the, the, uh, the mental health is. And if, whether it was a building, whether it was a city, the, the more options you have, the, the better things will work. Yeah, I think so, I think so. So um, we were talking about um, gentrification and, and two of my colleagues talked it in completely different, they described it in 
two different ways. Uh, Margarita Iglesia, which uh, they, her interview is already um, is already uh, published. She she was telling me about um, about modernizing buildings, and she said we need buildings get old, and we need to modernize them. And when we modernize them, uh, we're gonna spend when we renovate, we're gonna spend a lot of money, and that will uh, increase expenses, and that uh, will you know make real estate more and more expensive. Probably we have to replace them with new high rise buildings and that would be pretty much, um, very much expensive. And then um, another, another quote Ron Horn, um, he described gentrification as um, gentry as an entry and an entry and an exit. And he said, one one class would enter and one class would exit, and which kind of complement Margarita's um, Margarita's uh, description. It's like we need to modernize, and when we modernize, we'll get new people. So this is probably a not not an easy question to ask, but have you seen ways of um, renovating or modernizing buildings or historic because you know it, you just you just uh, uh, commended the the historic preservation of the city without raising uh, the and another thing is probably preserving historic buildings it's hard to tell if it's going to going to be cheaper or more expensive I'm just thinking out loud here but from your experience and the, the long time you've been in the city, um, what what did you see, did you see any success in um, modernizing? I, I, I think without... is her name Margaret. Margarita Iglesia. She's Margarita. a she's a professor. She's an urban planner and professor. Okay. I, I think Margarita has a little bit of a perspective that. Um, it's either or, that it has mm -hmm. to be one way or the other. And also that there's something perhaps a bit classic, classist, aristocratic, um, exclusive about historic preservation. And I would say to her, I, I, I respectfully disagree. Boston is filled with all kinds of adaptable reuse examples. Um, I did graphic design, branding, and, and um, redesign of a, uh, what became a shopping area in um, uh, Dorchester, near Dorchester Lower Mills. And it had been a large paint factory at one point. And today it has a stop and shop and uh, a variety of other stores. It left in place existing buildings. Um, which were uh, the, the, the exteriors were preserved because they're worth it and they are our history. And, um, and then it built also new buildings that were not made to look ye old at all that are, that are really nice contemporary architecture. Uh, I can think of public housing, uh, both for, you know, lower income people, but also for, uh, um, seniors where you know uh beautiful 19th century buildings have been converted to housing uh there is a several former boston schools public schools in the jp neighborhood that are uh some are uh senior housing some are homeless shelters for people who are getting on their feet where they're being, some are group homes. Um, and um, yeah, and they could do it and they did it affordably. I think it's too easy to cite, we can't afford to preserve. Now, one place where Margarita and I might agree is I feel Boston is extremely timid about going up. And yes, I care about shadow lines and things like that, 
but I think that the uh, find the uh, seaport is incredibly stubby and squat looking. It should have been allowed to go at least another 10 stories higher. And I would say almost the same number of floors could be added for density in the South End's ink block area, which has a lot of new construction. And it could have been very vital and nice and would have housed more people and probably brought the unit costs down if on that footprint, the air rights had been allowed to go up more. So I think Boston does that sometimes, is, is too cautious in the areas where it's building new stuff um, with density. Um, I hear, I, I go to a lot of public community meetings in my neighborhood, or I did, now they're on Zoom. We used to actually meet in rooms and stuff, believe it or not. And, um, you know, people would say, well, I don't want that building there because it spoils my view. Well, the thing is, unless you own the air rights there, it's not yours. It's not kind of fair. And then the other thing that kind of gets under my skin is, but it will, then it will be so dense. And um, so dense, well, why are you living in a city? I, I, I sometimes think. And, you know, where will we put all the cars? Well, in a city, not everyone needs to have cars. I don't have a car, um, you know, in, in our family of two, there is one car, but, um, you know, it gets used like when we go to Vermont, it gets used when we go to the Berkshires, it gets used when, uh, when we want to go out of town and see something in the suburbs, but um, it doesn't get used a lot and that's fine. Um, so you don't need to have parking or a garage with a hundred cars for a hundred people out of a hundred people maybe you need 60 cars i don't know you know um but i yeah i i i don't think there's anything um exclusive about preserving our, our history and i think we destroy it at our peril and i think that's a big part of what's wrong with the united states and it's a you know uh, uh, this ease of letting go of who we are and who we've been and then that model or that that evidence of who we've been is then gone for forever. In my home state of Vermont, um, you know, we live in one of the least religious parts of the United States in New England. And a lot of churches here in my neighborhood have been converted to condominiums. Occasionally one, you know, I know a, I know a synagogue that is a lecture hall at BU um, I, uh, but mostly I think things go into housing and, um, in my home state in Vermont, you know, we don't have the dairy farms we had at one point and neither do we have all the people going to church that we had at one point, but there's an understanding that that is a part of our cultural heritage, those buildings. And so there's really generous state um, tax breaks for the maintenance of those buildings. And there are grants available for stabilization, for painting, for putting the proper roof on a building if it needs slate and congregation cannot afford that. Well, the state of Vermont will chip in and, and then some NGOs, uh, land trusts and architectural organizations will help them do that. So, um, I don't want to sell our heritage short. It's, it's, it's something we can afford to do. And we can also afford to do several things at once. People sometimes think, oh my God, we can't save the planet and have Elon Musk go off in space. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, of course we can. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a conservative. I'm not a right winger. But I, I, and I do believe we have a problem with concentrated wealth in our country. But I, I also feel like, you know, let's, let's be a little bit more hopeful here and let's learn how to do the things we need to do. And we do, we need to create a ton of housing in Boston. Uh, definitely affordable housing. The building that, that this building that my office is in um, when it was built, had a percentage of carve-outs for first-time homebuyers. 
And so the, those units were less money. They were awarded by a lottery system. And over 30 years, they gradually climb up to market, but they were designed so they could not be flipped and make a huge profit. Because though this building was in a somewhat recovering neighborhood and people couldn't say for sure it was gonna become a success in the year 2000, um, today, it's very clear it has become a success. There's a lot of street traffic and restaurants and Pilates studios, and retail. And um, so, yeah, it, it worked. Um, but we also have to manage things like the population of Massachusetts Avenue and, uh, uh, and Mass and Cass, as it's called, where um, we have a concentration of homeless and addicted citizens uh, hanging out, but also they're there ostensibly to receive services, services, which are all concentrated in one single medical center. So in a sense, what we've done is we've ghettoized, excuse me, we've ghettoized a problem. So I, I was speaking about um, the concentration of services at one medical center, at Boston Medical Center for basically all um, addiction services and homeless uh, services. And what's happened is there's been a real explosion by doing that rather than decentralizing it and having, bringing online three or four other medical centers to share the load and other neighborhoods. It has been concentrated here in the South End. And it's, there's a term NIMBY, not in my backyard which is sometimes derisively used for places that do not accept social services. Well, the South End, I've, I've been here since 83, um, has over 30 uh, social service organizations that work here with homeless shelters, with uh, group homes, all kinds of things from Victory Programs, which is a drug treatment program, um, and we happily accommodate it. The thing is we can't do it for the whole city or all of Eastern Massachusetts without sort of killing the neighborhood. So we, we need relief. That's an, gonna be an important part of the mayoral election uh, coming up this year. And um, it's just about a, a sense of fairness and understanding how much an urban fabric can absorb of, of social dysfunction beside function. And so, it, uh, you know, we need to find our way there. We need to find a responsible way of taking care of these folks, but also not um, setting back urban renewal that has been successful and um, eliminating the, you know, lowering the value of people's homes, think that, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, my next question is going to be, what do you do for recreation around in the city? Oh. Well, my neighborhood is blessed with, I think it's 22 community gardens. And um, it's amazing. And a lot of places uh, don't have that, but there's a lot in, in Massachusetts in our cities. And um, very early on, they were put, into a, a land trust, uh, first a very local land trust, and then uh, an organization called the Boston Natural Areas Network uh, absorbed our community gardens responsibility for them. At our consent, we voted for it. And then they merged with the uh, very successful and, and high profile organization called the Trustees of Reservation, which is a over a 150 year old organization that uh, their goal is to preserve the Massachusetts landscape for everyone forever. And um, so that generations from now, there'll be these wonderful places to visit and garden in. And um, so uh, hike in and, and they, they cover the whole uh, Commonwealth from Eastern Massachusetts right out to the New York border. And uh, there's about 130 
something properties, I believe. And I've hiked in, I think, 72 or 73 of them. Uh, it's a great system. But so I, I like hiking. I like gardening. I love riding my bicycle. Um, that That is some of my recreation. Um, what else do I do? More passively might be things like uh, when we can, uh, concerts, lectures, um, that kind of thing. The a, a city is a very vital and good place to grow old. And unfortunately, um, all of us face that time in our life when, you know, we're no longer 20, we're no longer 30, we're no longer 40, and I am in my early 60s. And uh, I think like, this is where I want to spend the rest of my life. I don't want to go to Florida. Um, I don't want to be around one age group. I love the vitality that every fall we get this huge infusion, not just from around the United States, but from around the world of young people who come here to learn. And I think, you know, for me as a teacher, it's a great honor to help educate the world. And, um, but they just change the energy and contribute. And I think it's good for us to be mixed like that by age, by race, by religion. It makes for a cosmopolitan, um, not fearful place. Uh, you become comfortable with each other when you live with each other. And so we know how to read each other in, in Boston. We know who comes from where and, uh, and I think what you learn is that we're all far more alike than we are different. And um, so it doesn't matter what faith you are, or if you don't have a faith, we love our kids. You know, we love our families, we love our neighbors and, or we should. And um, so I think a city is a great place to age. Um, and, you know, I, I visit uh, some in-laws who live in Florida and in their uh, gated community, um, as my father-in-law says, um, the most exotic they can find in there, you know, of people they could find is maybe occasionally a Jewish person or an atheist, but like most everyone is white and Christian and it's an old, and it's just not a very exciting setting. So, you know, yeah, the people that clean the building are people of color, the people who do the landscape, but they don't socialize together. And so it's like it's, a golden cage. It is a golden cage. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure my, my in-laws are never going to see this interview. Um, and, you know, I'm always happy to visit them. But I'm really, truly happy when I get back to the airport and I see Red Sox hats and Patriots T-shirts. And I feel like, yeah, here it is in February and I can't wait to get back to Boston. It's like, this is, they're my peeps. This is my place. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I like, I think that's, that's the, a very good thing about cities is the diversity. It, it's a big mix and I can walk literally 12 minutes from door to door, from house to office. And some days I can count five or six languages that I hear. Um, today I heard Portuguese, I heard French, I heard a Scandinavian language. Um, I heard of course Spanish because we have a lot of Spanish neighbors. I heard Chinese and um, you know, so it's, uh, I think it's it's dynamic and beautiful and uh, yeah, I love it. My family, you know, loves coming here. They love how dynamic it is. They, yeah, we haven't gotten on to it all to Boston's culture. And I think, you know, we, for a small city, um, the fact that our Museum of Fine Arts is the, um, it's, it's, it's such an amazing institution and in that uh, it's really one of the first museums in the country that looked at what some used to call primitive art, African art, art from Oceania, art from Asia, and look at it not as a curiosity, 
um, but look at it as full-fledged art and the MFA uh, does that and pre presented those cultures early on as at least as equal to our own. And so that, that's great. But we also have this incredible cache of, I think, 54 Monets under that roof. And it is the largest concentration of Monets anywhere in the world outside of France. The Met doesn't have it. The National Gallery doesn't have it. Um, the Hermitage in Russia does not have it. So it's, yeah, this is a, this is a, a we have great resources here. Both, you know, I, I, I would I would say a criticism I have is that culturally we can be conservative. I, I wish we had more great contemporary art, more great contemporary music. Um, we tend to go, we can be a little, I don't want to dismiss classic art, but it can be a little predictable and a little uh, Eurocentric, though Though the MFA has a great collection of South American, Central American, Oceanic and Asian art and African art, but um, we could do better. We For contemporary, I think that, that there's a weakness. And I think the Institute of Contemporary Art is really starting to flesh that out for us. Um, yeah. So, that's probably brings me to the last question. If you had the funds and the authority, what would you do? How would you make things better? Even better, I would, because it's it's amazing. And I've been to Boston. I don't live in Boston, but very close. Yeah. So it. <sighs> um, I would invest more, even more, I should say, in public schools. Public schools are a breeding ground of democracy, um, you know, and we have ample evidence of that in Boston with so many people who came here from around the world and chose to be an American. The thing I don't understand about the anti-immigration uh, element in our country today is like, well, where did your folks come from? Because just in my one little family, we have Moroccan, French, Dutch, English, Scottish, Norwegian, Finnish in one family. And um, we all come from someplace. And I don't know, I, I think it's, it's an incredible gift. And I think, you know, nations need to get that immigrant nations do need to get it right in terms of making sure we can communicate with each other because I can't, we can't be a nation if we can't talk to each other. But I think I'd invest more in public schools. I would um, definitely invest more in affordable housing. Um, I would increase the taxes upon the very rich among us. Um, that's not something Boston can do or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts can do, except in a state tax way, but we're not going to. That needs to come from our federal government. We have steadily lowered the tax burden of the wealthy in the United States uh, since the late 1960s. Um, it really accelerated under President Reagan in the 1980s and has continued unstopped since. And um, there is this notion of trickle down benefiting the country. I think there's ample evidence it does not trickle down and um, it con has concentrated wealth. So I would like to see a more egalitarian society. Um, and I also think culture is not does not belong solely to the educated and the rich. We, I think we sell out and underestimate that people who do not have a high school diploma, a college degree, that somehow they don't understand or appreciate culture. And I, I just know that's wrong. Um, it's not true. I think, I think it's, you know, I have seen, I have seen people who are college educated, who carry around a lot of prejudice. And I've seen people who didn't finish high school, who are not racist, not homophobic, not disrespectful of women. And um, so I think, you know, my goal would be a more affordable city, uh, a more egalitarian city, 
where where more people can participate in our cultural life and um but i'm hopeful i think this is a, i think this is a really great city yeah thank you so much oh you're that, welcome that was that was amazing jim thank you so much i great. really enjoyed this interview and me <laughs>